Hi guys, it's Craig here and welcome back to my vinyl channel. Today I want to do a two-part series on how to archive your vinyl. And why would you want to do that? Some people say, well, you know, you buy the records, why would you want to digitize them and put them on your computer? Well, there's lots of reasons why you might want to do that. One of them being you might want to listen to your vinyl on a portable device when you're not at home. And certainly there's a great ways to capture your vinyl accurately onto a, onto a portable device so that it sounds just as good as the original vinyl. And number two, uh, you might want to, if you buy a new record and you want to remember what it sounded like the first time you played it, perhaps to find out if your stylus is starting to wear out or, you know, if the record is starting to wear out, which I doubt, but, you know, just in case you have that question, you can always go back and listen to the original recording of your vinyl. So I want to show you how to get the best results when you're archiving your vinyl. The last thing you want is to color the sound or do anything to it that's going to set, make it sound less like vinyl than it already does. So in order for you to do that, you're going to need some software, which we'll talk about in the second part of this video. And, you're, and it's free, right? But there's going to be some settings and some parameters that you're going to have to pay attention to when it comes time to do this. Now, of course, I'll just cover this really quickly. You have to find a way to hook your turntable up to your computer. Some turn ta turntables have USB output on the back, which is great. You can pipe it right into your computer, no questions asked. Um, if you don't have one of the, a turntable that has that, then you can certainly get it in there. You just need a preamplifier, a proper phono preamplifier. Some turntables have them built in, some don't. So if, you, if yours does, you can use that built-in preamplifier if you're happy with the sound of it. And just plug the, the turntable right into your computer, into the auxiliary input, and use Windows, you know, control panel to direct the sound to where it's supposed to go and all that, all that jazz. I can help you through that in part two of this video. Um, if it doesn't, if you don't have a built-in preamp or you don't want to use that, then certainly whatever preamplifier you like the sound of will work. And you just take the output of that with a jack or a, a set of plugs and right into the back of your computer. Okay. I have a USB um, audio interface that I use. Uh, so I plug my turntable into a preamp and then from the preamp into the USB audio interface and then from USB into the computer. So mine has a couple extra stages, but it works the same. Okay. So either way, you're good. Once you got it hooked up, you're ready to go. And again, I'll cover more of that uh, later on. Now, settings. And there's a lot of talk about this in this community about which bit rate you should use, which sample rate you should use, which bit depth you should use. And there's a lot of opinions. Listen, I'm going to let you decide. Okay. You need to be the one to decide which parameters to choose because there's a draw, you know, a, a, a drawback between hard drive space and quality, you know, there's a toss up. So you're going to want to pick the optimum settings. Let's, let's suppose you've got your turntable hooked up. Well, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here and you're about to start recording, but you've got to set up the software. Now you're going to see some numbers that you might be familiar with. You might've seen them before. So I'm going, to, I'm going to explain two very important parameters that you're going to have to decide upon when you do this. Two of them. Now, the third one is bit rate. The only time you're going to have to worry about bit rate is if you're converting your vinyl to MP3 or another compressed format, which you, you can do. But I happen to think that if you're going to go through the trouble of doing this, um, you might want to stick to lossless formats or, you know, WAV formats that don't have any compression, uh, digital compression. However, you know, if you want to listen to your, your music on a, on a portable device, you can convert it to MP3s after. All right, now that's a different story. What you're going to be running into here are two different parameters. I wish I had a pointer. There go. Drumstick will do. Okay. Um, bit depth. I'll explain that for you and sample rate. And I will explain that for you. Now you've seen some of these numbers. You've seen these two together a lot. Um, I'm sure. Uh, 16 bit, 44.1 kilohertz, right? Um, you've seen those. They, they actually are the numbers that CDs use. Compact discs use 16 bits, 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. Okay. Again, I'll explain all these things in just a minute. You've seen 24 bits, you've seen 32 bits. 
and you've seen 48 kilohertz and 96 kilohertz, and you might have even seen 192 kilohertz. All right. Um, so what is all this? What are all these numbers, and what do they mean? Right. Well, first let's talk about bit depth. When you encode um, digital, when you encode analog music into digital, uh, you have to sample the music, and what that means is you're taking it's like taking a loaf of bread and cutting it up into slices. Okay. You're taking the music, the wave of the music, like, let's say this is the wave of the music, you know, this is the waveform, and you're chopping it up into little bits, little, I shouldn't say bits because you might get confused with the term, little segments, let's just say. And each one of those segments has a value depending on where on the wave form it lands. Okay. Now, when you, uh, anytime you, you deal with digital, you're dealing with bits, okay? So how many, for all you, here's, let, let's go back to high school for a minute. All you high school guys who took computers in high school, how many bits are in a byte? Okay, you, we all know what a byte is, a, a kilobyte, a megabyte, or just a byte. A byte contains eight bits. A bit is either a zero or a one. It's a digital representation uh, of, a, of a state. So you can either have an, a one, which is an on or a positive, and a zero, which is an off or a negative. And that's the only way computers can store data is either on or off, zeros and ones. We use zeros and ones in the math, and we use transistors inside of computers to, to register either it's turned on or it's turned off. When you have millions of transistors all storing these, these binary digits, you can actually store a lot of information. Okay, so 8 bits is 1 byte. All right, that doesn't have a lot to do with what we're talking about, but it is binary and it is, uh, it's the same subject. Now, when we're talking sample rates, sample depths, bit depths, okay, um, the more, the, the higher the number, the more dynamic range you're going to have. Now, what's dynamic range? Well, uh, we call it headroom or dynamic range. Uh, the old term headroom used to be used in the old days with tape when you would be recording on a magnetic tape and the softest signal before it got buried underneath the noise and the loudest signal before it distorted on the tape. All that range in between is called headroom or dynamic range. Now, a cassette tape only has maybe 40, 40 dB of dynamic range. It's not a lot. And you can increase that using noise reduction and things like that. Um, uh, records, probably somewhere around the same. They've got a, quite a high noise floor. And so you don't have a lot of dynamic. You're going to only record so soft before the music gets buried in the noise and so loud before the needle jumps out of the groove and you can't track the record. Uh, seat compact discs. They have a 90 dB dynamic range, which is pretty good. Uh, you can you can record a really, really, really soft signal on a CD and you can still hear it and there won't be any noise or there's very, very little noise. And of course, all that range all the way up to when you can't get any higher. That's a lot of dynamic range, right? That's when you get when you use 16 bits. Why is this? Well, I've got this extra little column over here with these these numbers in it. This is 65,000. This is 16 million, and this is 43 billion. All right. What the hell? What the hell do these numbers mean? <laughs> All right. Stick with me. Hang tight. If you count in binary using only 16 bits, okay, so 16 zeros and ones in a row, going from all the way from 0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
okay, the number of different uh, amounts of amplitude. You can see I've got amplitude here, okay? This is the maximum level that the signal can be. So this would be zero along here. And of course it modulates and it, you've got your amplitude there. And this is time going this way. So as time moves on, there's your signal moving along, doing its thing. Um, in order to accurately represent each level of this waveform along as it goes, as you sample, you have to have a large number of bits to do that. So if you're using 16 bits, then you can have 65,000 different readings along this line here as you sample the audio into your computer. 65,000. That's quite a bit. That's not bad. And that's what CDs use. So 65,000 different levels that can be recorded and um, using 16-bit um, audio, 16 bits to record each, each sample of audio. I hope, you under I hope that's understandable. So, you know, that's quite a bit. That's pretty good. 16, you know, 65,000 is a pretty high number. I mean, you sit and t count up to 65,000, see how long it takes you, okay? So it's pretty good. However, some people don't think that's enough. And certainly for uh, distribution on CD, it's good enough. You pop it in, you listen, people don't think about it. It sounds fine, okay? But when, you're, when you have a choice, and when you're recording off of vinyl or off of tape or anything, even off of a microphone or an instrument, you want to try to use the highest you know, sampling fidelity that you can without going overboard and using up all your hard drive space. So the next number you see here is 24. 24 bits. Okay, 24 bits. If you record a signal using a 20, using 24 bits. Okay, so now instead of 16 ones or 16 zeros, you've got 24 ones or zeros. You can count up to a much higher number with this, uh, this amount of bits. As a matter of fact, somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 million you can count up to with that many, with 24 bits. Okay, so that's a lot. I mean, I'm happy with that. You want to sit and count up to 16 million? Good luck to you. I'll see you in a few years. Okay, so that's a pretty high number. That means that you've got 16 million different readings or measurements that you can take along this line as the, as the sampling occurs, okay? So as you chop this up into little samples, just like this, and at each point you take a sample and you read that number and you put the number. Second point here, you read that number. You put that. Third point here, you read that number. Every sample gets a number and those numbers get strung together and stored on your computer. And that's how the music is represented. So the more of these numbers that we can represent, the more accurate your sampling or your recording, digital recording, is going to be. All right? Now, the next number is 32. I'm not even going to get into this, okay? Some people use 32-bit. If you, if you own a recording studio and you really want to get the absolute highest quality that's ever possible in this day and age, then you would use 32 bits. Uh, that'll give you about f almost in the neighborhood of 43 billion different readings that you can take in every single sample that is made of your of your uh, analog audio. That's a lot, and I think it's overkill. But if you're running a big recording studio and you're processing tracks and bouncing tracks from one to the other and putting them through digital processing and all this kind of thing, you really want the highest resolution possible so that as you go along. The, the reduction in quality is, is not going to be there, okay? You won't get a lot of degradation, if any at all, at 32-bit. But for our purposes, if you're just wanting to take some analog source, like vinyl, and put it on your computer as digital, then you only need to really work with these two numbers here. And it's really up to you which one you choose, okay? You gotta listen, you gotta decide, is it worth the extra hard drive space to go up to 24-bit? I think it is but that's up to you, all right? So that's bit depth, all right? And those are the three numbers you'll probably have to choose from when you make this decision. At the end of this video, I'll tell you what 
combination I use. Now the other side, sample rate. Um, this is how many times per second that the analog signal is going to be sampled. So as we move along in time, right, how many times per second is the sampler going to say, okay, grab that data and store it. Okay, grab that data and store it. Okay, grab that data and store it. How many times per second? Again, the higher this number, the more accurate the sample will be, and more particularly, the higher the frequency response you're going to be able to record. So let's, for example, take 44.1. Okay, there, again, that's what CDs use. A compact disc uses 16 bits, and it samples at 44.1 kilohertz, or 44.1 thousand hertz times per second. So in one second, it slices the waveform up 44.1 thousand times. Again, that's a lot, okay? What that allows, and the rule of thumb is that the frequency response you're going to get is going to be half of, roughly half of, the sampling rate. So if you're using 44.1 kilohertz to sample your music, you're going to get around 22 kilohertz maximum, okay? Now the human, human hearing generally goes from 20 to 20,000 hertz when you're born. It goes downhill from there. By the time you're 25 years old, you might be lucky to have 20 to 15,000 hertz frequency response in your, in your hearing. So, you know, if you're a middle-aged person like me, 22,000 hertz is way out of range. I'm never going to hear it. I never could hear it. And it's way up there, okay? So it's really not a problem. The only thing that people concern themselves is, with is that when you get close to the upper limit of the sampling rate, okay, you start to run into some quantization problems and they have to start filtering it inside the, inside the, the converter and things can, not always, but then they can get a little bit um, problematic and you can end up with what, what are called um, beat notes, uh, you can end up with some sorts of distortion or, uh, you know, dithering or, or uh, not dithering, but um, aliasing and all these weird sound effects that can happen that give people the, uh, the, the nail on the chalkboard thing when they listen to a CD. Some people can't, can't listen to CDs because they, can, they think they can hear this, this distortion that's going on, especially on cheaper CD players. And that's what gives CDs their harsh sound that some people claim they have, okay? Because if you don't take care of this top end properly, you can end up with weird artifacts that can make weird effects happen, okay? So, all right, well, the next one we've got 48. So 48 kilohertz. So this, again, quickly, then you're chopping this thing up as time goes on, 48,000 times per second, you're grabbing a sample and you're recording it on the hard drive. Okay? Um, that's a pretty big number. That's pretty good. That's higher than CD quality. And it allows you up to 24,000 hertz frequency response. Well above anybody's hearing range. All right? And pretty, still fairly significantly below the upper limit so that you're not toying with, you know, the upper limits of, of digital sampling which, sampling, which again can get a little cumbersome, a little weird. All right, so that gives you lots of room. So if you're trying to record a 20 kilohertz sine wave using 48 uh, kilohertz sampling frequency, you're going to get a 20 kilohertz sine wave and it's going to be perfect. All right, no problem. And a sine wave, of course, is the purest form of a of an energy signal or, or of energy um, and if you can record a sine wave at 20 kilohertz you have all of the frequency response you need to reproduce every note of music and you'll hear it all as long as your hearing goes up to 20,000 hertz okay so 48 not much higher but it certainly gives you that extra little leeway to prevent any possible problems with cheaper um, digitizing equipment, all right? The next one up is 96. Well, that gives you 48 kilohertz frequency response, so you can record a sound up to 48 kilohertz, which is more than double what you can hear. 
And as far as I'm concerned, unless you're, again, in a big recording studio where you're really doing a lot of processing and you're working with these files all day, day in and day out for months and months, you really don't need to be bothering with 96. Some people claim they can hear the difference between 48 and 96. That's 96,000 samples per second, giving you, 20, giving you 48 kilohertz, up to 48 kilohertz frequency response. Some people claim they can hear the difference between 48 and 96. I would love to meet those people and do a blind test with them because I don't understand how it's possible to hear the difference between frequencies that you can't hear in the first place, right? So my opinion, and I'll get flack for this, I know, you know, you can do what you want. I'm not dictating what you should and shouldn't do. But in my opinion, this is overkill. And there's one above it, 192, which is just crazy. That'd give you 96 kilohertz frequency response. That's what, three times higher than what you can actually hear? Yeah, it's a little crazy for what we're doing here. In a recording studio setting, fine. They can do what the heck they think they need to do. But for what we're doing, you don't need that number. You, let's cross them out. You don't need these guys because it's overkill and you're only going to waste your hard drive space. Okay? So, with that said, again, you can do the experiments. You can try these numbers. You can figure out which ones are best for you. If you can hear the difference between 48 and 96 kilohertz sampling rate, if you're going to sleep better at night using 96 and 32 bits, that's up to you. Completely up to you. I wouldn't do it. It is really, really not necessary in this situation. Okay. So what would I put use? Well, when I hook my turntable up to my computer and I'm setting it up to record, I use these, t these two here, I use 24 uh, bit and 48 kilohertz sampling rate. That gives you a lot of dynamic range, a lot of dynamic, I mean, more dynamic range than you, you will ever need. Okay. And it also gives you a lot of frequency response, more than you need. So those are your golden numbers. Okay. Certainly nothing wrong with these guys. I mean, arguably, some people think that it's too low. It is basically the lowest you can go before you start hearing the difference big time. All right. So these guys here, they're borderline. It's good enough. CDs sound pretty good to me. I like the sound of them. Uh, but if you really want to go the safe route and get good quality for not a lot of hard drive space, these are your guys. So when you set up your software, use 24 bit, 48 kilohertz sampling rate and you're good to go. You can always downsample it later into an MP3 using 16-bit at 44.1. And, you know, if you want to make it smaller, you can do that. You can always, but it's always best to start off with the best you can without going completely off the deep end and doing it, doing things that aren't necessary. So I hope this made sense to you. Now that you know what the numbers mean, I hope you do. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me down below in the comments and I will be putting part two of this video out very soon. If not, if it's not out already, I'll be putting it out very soon. We will actually do the archiving of some vinyl and go through the steps and show you how it works. And as soon as I get that done, I'll put a link down below and at the end of this video to part two of this. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. And keep spinning those records, guys. Vinyl is final. Thanks.